I'm Charlie Lennon, and I'm going to be talking to you about traditional Irish music on the fiddle and some of the many techniques that we use to produce that unique sound that makes the music so different from other forms. But before we get into those techniques, let's talk for a moment about some of the basics, some of the fundamentals. Now, you may think that holding the fiddle and holding the bow is dead simple, and it should be, but you can get so many things wrong. For example, I can pick up the fiddle like this, and the bow like this, and that's fine until I go to play, but I can't actually do anything other than hold the fiddle and bow. Why? Well, there's umpteen things wrong with it. Let's have a look. First of all, I've got the fiddle in the wrong hand, so I switch hands and try again. Now, funnily enough, people actually pick up the fiddle like this and put their fingers round like this, and it's practically hopeless to try and get any sound or tone out of the fiddle because you have no power in the fingers that way around. So you switch round to here, which is the way the fiddle was designed for. Now, let's get a few of lines straight here. One, the, the fiddle, for comfort, should be more or less parallel. The elbow should be well under, so that you don't have any problem rolling on the third and fourth strings. And the thumb should be just tipping over the fingerboard. Let's have a look at that close-up. You should have it such that it's like that. There you are again. Okay, so we have the fiddle in the right spot. Now the chin and head are important. It should fit in just nice and neat under the chin. But for God's sake, don't have the chin tense like that and the teeth tense and your tongue sticking up onto the roof of your mouth because you won't be able to smile or talk or play the fiddle. So have a relaxed chin and a relaxed head and shoulder behind. Relaxation is the key to all of this. Okay, let's look at the bow now. Let's get a close-up of the grip on the bow. First of all, you'll get this in any good textbook. It should be across the fingers like that, with the bow, with the, with the thumb, like that, cocked up a little bit, not flat, just there so it can waddle like that, with lots of, lots of freedom. And when you have it up here, it should hang more or less like that, and that wrist should be loose and relaxed. Very important, again, the relaxation. Right, and then let's look at the elbow. The elbow should not be sticking up like this and tense. It should be down like this and relaxed. And the shoulder should be relaxed and, put, and the bow on the strings. So it's something like that. Try it and see how it goes. Okay, your first action then is to get open strings going. Down bows, up bows, using the top of the bow, using the bottom of the bow. I'm sure you've been through this before. But it's important to get it right. There shouldn't be any real pressure on the on the strings from the bow except the weight of the bow. And it should be tilted a little bit so the rod is slightly away from you, the wooden part. Sounds simple, and it is simple when everything is properly in place and at all times be relaxed. So let's just look at this one more time. Well, we've just been talking about some of the basics in terms of holding the fiddle, holding the bow. And of course, the bow is very important, particularly in Irish music, because it determines very much the structure of the tune and how it's phrased and so on. And I'll be going into that later on. The bow is also important in terms of uh, how the notes come out, preventing too much scratching, getting a good solid tone from the fiddle. And of course, in using the bow for ornamentation, which is what I want to talk to you about next. So let's look at some of the techniques that we use with bow only. And why do we want to use bow? Well, there are many situations where you can't use finger 
ornamentation or you're limited in thinking of ornamentation. Why is that? Well, we love to ornament notes in Irish music, just like in our speech, we're flowery in our speech, but we love to ornament. And we ornament many notes in the tune in many different ways. A very common way is to simply play, if you have a, for example, a B there, you play the note above it, the note itself, the note below it, and the note itself. Very common sort of ornamentation. However, if you're playing, say, with your little finger, while you can't ornament above that little finger without shifting up, which we don't do that in Irish music, generally speaking, or if you're on an open string, you can't go below that note to, to ornament around it. So you have to find a different way of ornamenting open strings and uh, notes played with your little finger. So what do we do? We have a problem. We invent something. We invented what we call the treble bow. Now, the treble bow is, in fact, five notes in total. There's sort of two lead notes, and then there's three notes that are played very rapidly together, like a triplet, but perhaps not as balanced out as a, as a, as a triplet. And the funny thing about it is that if you try to play them da 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 and you play them slowly, and you try to build up da 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 It's a different approach. It's an approach where you actually relax the, the right hand and let the bow go floating free almost, and let it do the bouncing. Now, I remember as a kid, I first came across this, I was a saint for a few months, and I was mad into it. And there was this tune called The Harvest Home, and the high part, the B part of The Harvest Home, there is a section that, which demands this treble bow. And I couldn't get it. And it was really throwing me. And the tune was, didn't sound right without this treble bow. And then suddenly, one night, I was about eight at the time, came to me, and I was delirious. Couldn't sleep that night. Went to school the next morning. Couldn't concentrate on one single thing until lunchtime. And always worrying me was, what it, could I do it again? Was it a one-off, or could I actually reproduce it? Out from school, ran down home, in straight into the room, got the fiddle out, tried it again, and there it was. A fiddle. And in fact, the best way to practice and learn the treble bow is on that tune, the harvest tune, because it's a spot in there where it just doesn't happen unless you have it. So let's look at it first. It's the notes are they're the actual notes. When you speed those up, you get... And then... So that's what the treble bow is, and it really means that you, you have to allow this bow to wobble on your thumb, and you have to allow the whole hand loose and let the work come from the back. Let the old arm shoulder and the wrist all go loose and let this let this bow produce the end result. So So there's the uh, the travels coming in and in fact you can practice them on any open string. I say open and then it's not so monotonous just trying it out. So it's a good Good practice, just start on the bass, work your way up the strings, just treble bowing and open strings. Okay, now there is, what else can we do with the bow in that particular tune? Well, you might notice there's a run down from the F sharp up here, down to the open D. And again, being Irish, we want to give a bit of a variety to that, to that run, so we invent uh, ways of ornamenting it. And one is to use the staccato bowing. That's simply up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way down. Simple. Another alternative is to go... You actually change the notes a little bit. The sequence is that you're covering is the same. 
just add variety. And the third way would be the bow. Three notes through bow, all the way down. Okay, so those appear in many hornpipes and indeed in many places throughout Irish music. Um, and we're going to illustrate them now with the harvest home itself. So let's take the tune from the top through. Let's have a listen to it in a session set up with Steve Cooney on guitar, Tommy Hayes on Bowron, and myself on fiddle. So here we go. enjoy that. You can see the sort of buzz that you get out of playing together. It's really great. Okay, we've spoken about uh, ornamentation with the bow. Let's look now at uh, ornamentation using the, the, the left hand, the fingers. And we're going to be talking about rolls. So let me turn around and illustrate perhaps on a close-up what's actually happening in finger rolls. In this situation here, I've got my first finger index finger on the third string and I'm going to be talking about how to ornament that as a melody note. Now to ornament it we have a choice of playing either the note above it, the note first itself, then the note above it, the note itself, the note below it and the note itself. Or in Irish music we actually have an option of using this finger so we actually skip a note and we go from the note itself to the but it's put in rapidly, so it goes. And you can actually practice that. And if you practice it using the top of the bow here and just try with a nut bow. And then you can practice it on the second string. I'm straining a bit here just to illustrate the, uh, the, the rolls as you see there on the first string. And then you can actually do it on the bass string, provided that your left hand is tucked in well under the, the, the fiddle there. So you can go. And that's a good test to see if in fact your left arm is in the right position. So just practice those. And just try it with the one, the single bow upwards. And when you practice with that on the up bow, then you can try it on the down bow. Now that particular ornamentation occurs 
in all rhythms, reels, jigs, hornpipes, varieties, hostess, a lot. And it's very useful. And that particular finger comes in a lot. So if you get that off, you're well on your way. Finger here. Just a little bit harder to do. And then you can try it both an up bow and a down bow. And so on like that. And then finally on the second finger. Now with the second finger, you would probably use you'd probably be playing in B and be on an F sharp. And you'd use a G and an E as the, the two other notes. But sometimes you actually use the little finger here. So you go to give a little bit more of the finger ornamentation that we can uh, employ in, in, in the various rhythms. Now there is another finger ornamentation which is a little easier to do actually. And we call it, you can call it a grace note or a cut. We call it a cut. Where you have a, and it comes up a lot in jigs, for example, where you, where you need to ornament, let's say, that note there. And you cut it with the, with the, with the third finger. So you go, but it's fast. Now the beauty of that ornamentation is that you, you can actually use it on an open string as well. You can ornament an open string. So it's quite useful there. I spoke about ornamenting with the treble bow on the open string. Well, you can actually ornament in some cases, particularly in jigs, with that one. And a particular jig that's useful to illustrate this is a jig called A Smile from Sheila. And I'll run over for you now, fairly slowly, so you can actually see what's happening. And in this case, I'm going to keep the bow straight. I'm not going to use bow ornamentation if I can, if I can uh, accomplish that. And I'm just homing on the style of uh, finger or ornamentation that can be used in this particular gene. simple but it's nice it works well let's hear it in session then with the, the three lads again Nice. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, we're going to go into some more intricate bowing and rolls and so on, finger ornamentation. But before that, probably it's best for you to maybe stop the tape and just practice what we've done so far. And it's a good idea generally to stop at any point along in the tape and just say, right, can I do that? What exactly does he mean? Roll it back, go over it again, work on it like that until you're happy and then move on to the next. Okay, so we're going to um, 
talk now about other forms of finger ornamentation. And we're going to be talking about uh, runs. We had runs and horn pipes. We're going to have runs in, in reels. And by that, I mean we're going to be running down from, say, the high strings down to the low strings. And it's important to get a feel for what's actually happening there and also what's happening with the bow because they both work together. So let's look at a run and I'm going to pick a tune again, it's, it's a fairly well known tune, it's called Funny Kate and we're going to look at uh, Coleman's setting of it and how this finger, this finger ornamentation works so well in that. Uh, we're talking about I'll do that now more slowly. You go. There are the notes. And equally important is the bow direction for those notes. And when you switch direction of bow. You can break it there. And break it there. That's one version. Or you can run it even further. And you notice that I put in a new uh, finger ornamentation there. It's a slide. Slides come in all over the place in Irish music. And uh, unlike, say, in classical music, where you go dead on the note all the time, we, we like to run up the note. And indeed, we sometimes bend the note round. Just like in, say, harmonica, you might bend the note. So there's the notes and there's the bows and we could we call that a sort of a cascading effect where you have that run of notes. Equally well we could have so here we're doing like that and again of course it's putting a speed And you have to decide which, uh, well, how you bow it. So you can bow all of those on one note. And all, all those on one note. You can break them. If you break them too much, then it kind of upsets the tune. Doesn't sound so nice. So the choice of bow that runs with those... Uh, uh, finger ornamentations are uh, is very important. Okay, now let's see how we can put all of what we've learned together in one tune. And as I said, we're talking about Bunny Kate and Coleman's version of it. So I'll take you through it once, very slowly, so you get a feel for it. We're going to be seeing Trouble bows, which we started off with, we're going to be seeing various cuts. We're going to see those cascading rolls and those other rolls that I've just spoken about and other ornamentation, which we may come to later on. So here we go with Bunny Kiss. <laughs> Okay, let's hear that session now, and it's over again to Steve, Tommy, and myself.
Okay, that was Bunny Kate, and uh, it has great associations for me personally, as I remember as a small kid hearing that one of the early tunes. That particular setting is a setting that uh, Michael Coleman recorded in New York in 1934, and it swept the world literally that every musician who heard that said, my God, that's, that's, that's a beautiful setting. And if you've a chance to listen to that, the party is still around. Okay. Many people ask me, well, loads of questions, but in relation to the, the fiddle, they say, what's the difference between a fiddle and a violin? And uh, sometimes I try and make up humorous answers, but essentially it's the same instrument. It's exactly the same instrument. It's really how you use it and how you play it that makes a difference. And of course you play classical music in a particular way. The fiddle tends to be associated with jazz sometimes, and very much with the folk music, with Irish music. So, same instrument, play different things. That people ask me about double stopping. That's where you have a chord, say. How, when do you put a chord into the tune, and where does it fit, and what chord should you use? Well, that's a big subject, and you'd really want to study harmonies to understand what fits where, and so on. And the Steve Cooney could tell you lots about it. But uh, we can't get into it here. What we can say, though, is that you can employ double stopping uh, quite simply, where there's a run of the tune allows you to play two notes together. For example, if you're on a G and you're going up to a C. Boom. That comes in naturally. Or you go... You go from a G. You're getting a, a B and a G, which is a G chord. That comes in naturally. Uh, now, there's many chords on the fiddle that you can get. For example, in Donegal style, they, they play a lot with the little finger on the bass string. And the... Um, and in other situations, you'll do... Um, there's two other situations where you'd play chords in a fifth in that particular case. Okay, the, the general um, rule then is to uh, see if it comes into the tune itself or listen to other good fiddlers, see where they use double stopping. It can be very nice when it's used effectively and not overdone because then there's an element of surprise in it and Irish music is all about surprise. In fact, we, we never played it the tune the same way exactly every time. It really depends on our humour, as you'll see later in session work. Um, and uh, we have this flexibility uh, of playing, and indeed that's, that's allowable and it's part of the, the freedom that we enjoy. Uh, another uh, question that I keep a being asked is uh, the difference in styles. And of course that tends to be associated with geographical areas within the country, for example, Southwest, Kerry has a particular style. Clare has a particular style. Galway, Sligo, Leitrim, Donegal, Northern style. Um, so you have these particular styles and they say, well, what's the difference between them? And it's really the way in which the bow, the tune, the particular or ornamentation that they use. There are many things that uh, tend to dictate a style, the pace it's taken out. For example, the, the, uh, the Kerry style uh, would be um, Uh, habit of two fiddlers playing one in the regular position and the other fiddler an octave lower. So it'll be like that. So you have two fiddlers going and they're playing the same melody note but separated by an octave. And that particular style and that custom is peculiar to Kerry and Donegal. 
and there, as far apart as you can get in Ireland, and that's really the two pockets where you find it most. Um, so that's a little, very, uh, an example of the Kerry style. Now, I, I don't play Kerry music, and so that's only, uh, I suppose, a, a very rough illustration of, uh, of, of that plane. Similarly, in, in Clare, you tend to have a very relaxed, flowing style and sliding onto the note and taking it nice and easy. Uh, very sweet, very musical, not too much ornamentation, as in, say, Garrett Barry's G. <laughs> Again, if you go to Donegal, they tend to play uh, all straight bows. In other words, that most notes are separated, change of direction every note. They do a lot of chording. Uh, they do a lot of fast playing, which I'm not going to attempt to do, of single bows. And uh, but just to give you a, a very rough illustration of a pregnant woman, and here it's roughly what it sounds like. <laughs> like Johnny Doherty, the great Donegal fiddler, to hear the real Donegal uh, style. That's just a, a sort of a rough example to give you a feel. Well, of course, the style that's closest to my own heart, uh, since I'm a Leitrim man myself, live close to Sligo, would be the what's known as the Sligo style, North Connacht style, which brings in Roscommon, Sligo and Leitrim, but generally known as the Sligo style. And of course, the great Michael Coleman came from Sligo and made that style known, I suppose, all over the world. So, um, in that particular style, I suppose you could visualise it as being somewhere in between the Donegal and Northern style, which is really that short bowing, and the Southern Clare and Kerry style, which is long bowing. And we have an in-between there in, in the Sligo style. Lots of interesting variation, both, in, both with the bow and with the fingers. Lots of nice use of, of settings of tunes. Tends to be fairly fast with lots of things happening, many things happening. Very exciting, particularly exciting music. Very varied and full of surprises. Oh, and by the way, I was often asked when we're talking about lively music, uh, about what I do in terms of um, stomping my feet or moving my bottom. And uh, you probably heard there the foot going. That's part of it. I sometimes go double time when I get going with the reel and get moving. I think it just adds to the uh, excitement. This is inflection stuff. Um, the other thing I'm asked about uh, oftentimes is uh, switching from one rhythm to another rhythm and how that might be accomplished. And in this case, we'll take a, let's take a mazurka. Uh, mazurkas came originally from Poland, but we've I think about five of them in Ireland, and I play one of them. And um, no, I actually play two of them. Sorry. And uh, I'm going to try a mazurka, and then I'm going to go into a reel called Craig's Pipes, just to see the change. And then we look at that in a session scene. <laughs> Thank you. 
switch from mazurka into a reel. We look at uh, how that works in a, in, a, in a session, and we're going to introduce uh, Jerry O'Connor on banjo here, and you'll hear his particular style coming in and out uh, with the fiddle. So let's hear it now from the lads. That was a lively rendition of Craig's Pipes with Jerry O'Connor on banjo playing his own particular style that you probably noticed. Well, I'm often asked, how do you actually get good settings for tunes and how do you get the ornamentation, where to put it in, how do you get the bowing right and so on? And I've no hesitation in recommending a book which was called Musical Memories, written by a guy called Charlie Lennon. Looks vaguely familiar there on the cover. And uh, it's a book of tunes and in the, in the book, as you can see there, you have the melody line, you have the bowing, you have all the ornamentation, and indeed you have piano accompaniment and you have chords for guitar and bazooka and so on. And that should be available from your local music shop. And if you want to actually hear the tunes played, then we also have an album here on uh, CD and cassette, again available from your music shop. And I do recommend that you get the album and use it. But I'm also asked quite often about practicing and how one should practice, how one should uh, get these techniques off and then get on to playing full tunes and trying these techniques. Well, the answer, of course, is you practice every day, uh, at least 20 minutes if you can work it in, more up to an hour if you can manage it, or even more. And uh, you practice at a slow pace, you build it up gradually and take it up to speed. Take it easy, don't rush it. It will come naturally as you get more and more familiar with it. And then, if you have a chance to play in, with, in a session, that's where the excitement is. And that's where you go back feeling, God, I, I really had a ball there. And must have went to the next session coming up. Because it's there that you, you, you practice without realizing it. And you pick up other little things from mixing with people and watching people and seeing how the bowl is. An enormous amount of knowledge that you can pick up by actually being right in the middle of, of, of good players. The other thing is, of course, that you can always put an album on in your own house and play along with it and create a sort of a session atmosphere. It's not quite the same, but it's, it's a good substitute. And uh, hopefully with those that you can get into the swing of it and begin to get real enjoyment out of it. Okay, I'm also asked about phrasing and how one should phrase and again that's a big subject and it really depends on style you're employing, depends on the techniques that you're using and it depends on your approach to the music. Now a good way oftentimes of getting into a style is actually to lilt it to yourself because you don't have this bother of trying to decide what should hap be happening with the fingers and the bow and trying to control everything at the same time. And you can just actually concentrate on what is the end product that you're trying to produce, what's the end sound you're trying to produce. So listening uh, is a good way of getting a feel for the tune and where you give it a drag and where you go. Like this. So there 
there you see opportunities for putting in the long draws and the treble bows, for pausing for effect, for phrasing certain um, notes together. The other thing then is the excitement you get of playing the tune with another in different instrument. Uh, you can get a buzz out of two fiddles, but you can also get a great buzz from, say, the flute, where he's doing something which is actually complementary to what you're doing. He's putting in ornamentation, which is similar, but not quite the same. And again, with pipes or whistle or whatever and instrument. And that's where the brain starts opening up again. You're listening to what's going on. You should always be listening in a group situation or you're playing with others, always listening to what they're doing so that you can get into sync with them. Because there's no firm beat like in jazz music. You don't have well-defined bars. You feel your way as you go along. And there's not the same strictures. You, you, you tend to go over bars, um, just like with the slow airs. So you listen very intensely when you're playing with others so that you can pick up their vibes and their rhythm. And they're doing the same with you. So there's, there's a communication going on all the time. And if you watch good musicians and you're with them, you realize that there is this telepathy. But they actually know what the other guy is going to do next, even though he doesn't know himself. And that's where the great excitement comes in. And a good example of that is a tune called Kilty Town, which I wrote some years back, which has been recorded by Frankie Gavin, by lots of others, and is in that uh, Musical Memories album that I spoke about earlier. Uh, I'll, I'll take you through the, the tune, it's a three-part tune, and then we'll hear it in a, a real live session. <laughs> that I didn't tell you about, that's sort of a double roll, and I'll show you that now just over here. It's uh, where you go. That's a double roll. It's just like two rolls put together of the rolls that we spoke about uh, earlier on in the program. So, there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, that as much as we've enjoyed doing it for you here and I hope you have lots of fun because it's all about fun, it's all about enjoyment, it's all about letting yourself go, let it all happen and when you're relaxed and happy many many surprises come along and you the brain really gets into a sort of creative mode and you, you, you feel you can do lots of things and in fact you can do lots of things that you would never dream about under normal circumstances. So enjoy yourselves, have fun uh, from myself Charlie Lennon. Bye, keep up the practicing. And we're going out now. And this time, there's five of us together. We have the long tin whistle with Cormac Branagh. And we're doing Kilty Town. And I think you see what I mean when, we, when I say let go, because we're enjoying ourselves in this. So, bye for now. <laughs>